So, tell me something terrible. You ready to get started then? Sure. This is episode three. Okay. So if this was Star Wars, that'd be a big deal. We'd have to work backwards. Someone would die. I mean... If you tell me you're my father, I'm leaving. Yeah, that would be real awkward. There are some deaths, though. Eleven of them. Okay. Yep. Eleven? Mm-hmm. Sweet. I mean, there's more, but like, eleven specifically to this. Okay. okay. Sounds exciting. All right. All right. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Tiffany. And I'm Scott. Shit, I forgot my next line already. Uh... This is Tell Me Something Terrible, where Tiffany, who doesn't already know how to start the podcast, tells me, Scott, something terrible. And he interrupts. It literally explains it in the title. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, you'll have to excuse the nerves. We had the first two episodes we recorded blindly, and now there's people actually listening, so there's like pressure. So we're going to power through that and get, you know, record these like it's no big deal. Totally. And thank you for listening, if you did, and you still are. We're proud of you. Congratulations. So proud of you. Okay. We're going to give out participation trophies and everything. <laughs> it's a very millennial thing to do. Are we millennials? We're borderline, right? No. So, no. There's a division between Don't the two. Don't go into it. Let's go okay. into your story. All right. That's for no, that, that, uh, the, the generational assessments can be another terrible podcast. Oh, no. That's, that's episode just... four. Just kidding. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, today, we are going to be covering... Tonight. Tonight. I'm just kidding. You can listen to this whenever you want. Yes. Uh, Today we will be covering a terrible airborne infectious disease and a doctor who had a terrible idea. It's not COVID, I think, right? Nope. Okay, good. That'd be too soon. A little fresh? Yeah. Okay. And it's not the Spanish flu either. Good. I am not fluent. That's a Spanish joke. (laughs) You got it? Okay. (laughs) Good. I just want to start out strong and I'm going to fade out the rest of the episode. All right. Okay. (laughs) Great. Because... I mean, it's not that depressing. It is scary, though. All right. So what do you know about consumption? Um, consumption, the... Oh, you're talking disease-wise? Mm-hmm. Um, if, it's, if it's a lot, no, don't spoil it for everyone else listening. No, it's... the. This is... Uh, okay. Besides the fact that like, I went to school like for somewhat along this... Uh, most of our expertise in consumption comes from watching ghost shows. Oh, yeah? And they always go to like hospitals and sanatoriums yes yeah, san- yes sanatoriums um, it's not from my- watching moulin rouge no oh. i've seen it once mm. and i only know the elephant love song medley because it's on my spotify like songs <laughs> all right are you ready to learn a little bit let's do it okay so consumption i'm here to learn and totally um consumption was the original name for tuberculosis Okay. TB for short. Knew that much. You had a TB test, didn't you? Yeah, once. Was it awful? No. They put a bubble under your skin they and watch do. it go away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you don't have tuberculosis. Yeah, which most people don't. Now. So um, the patients infected with the disease were called consumptives or so lovingly called invalids, which I think is like the generalized term that's used for anyone that had anything like 5% wrong with them. So, you know, we've come a long way with terms for people. Can I interject with a really bad joke that I need to get out of the way? Go for it. You should have come up with 12 cases because then it could have been the TB12, which is Tom Brady's program. No, it's 11 because that's how many patients were taken down into. That's fine. Mind. That's fine. Just TB12 would have been, I mean, the jokes could have been easier. All right. Well, maybe you should take you really that up with a doctor that died 200 years ago. Okay. All right. <laughs> or 160. It doesn't matter. I'm bad at math. So let's start with a terrible disease. Tuberculosis, as we know it, was first evident in humans over 9,000 years ago. Its history can be traced back as far as 2700, 2700 uh, BC, where it was recorded in Chinese medical texts. Through the centuries, it spread and went by many different names, like Pott's disease, phthisis. Sorry, what was that? Phthisis. (laughs) It's P-H-T-H-I-S-I-S. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to name a fish that. Oh. uh, See? It's great. Scrofula. He's god of the aquarium. (laughs) The king's evil and the king's touch. 
Um, Hippocrates described it as the weaknesses of the lungs and the most commonest disease of the period and usually fatal, with the disease mainly affecting people's between 18 to 35. Right in the wheelhouse, right? Well, I mean, life expectancy-wise, I suppose that's... Yeah. Pretty good, right? Mature folk back yeah. then, yeah. Why was uh, it the king's touch? That's the one. Because um, people used to think that the touch of the royals would heal them of diseases. Oh, like Midas style? Yeah. Except with infectious diseases. Oh. Mm-hmm. I mean. So I'm going to pre-reference this next bit with I studied art, business, photography, barely any writing and aesthetics. So I'm not a doctor nor an epidemiologist or anything within the ballpark of such. And this is probably going to be an entertaining listen um, to me explaining a disease to you, of all people. Yes. For background, I did go to school for biochemistry, and my job is literally infectious disease testing. Yep. But that being said, because it's my job, and I don't like require continuing education, this will be good for me. I promise. Uh, probably. I won't. I won't like mansplain things to you. I promise, because I won't know them enough to do such. Good. Um, So TB can be transmitted through respiratory droplets in the air from coughing, sneezing, singing, etc. And after this pandemic, everyone knows how respiratory droplets can spread disease. If you're a spitty singer, maybe don't sing that close to people's faces. (laughs) Oh, like, um, what's his name from Hamilton? Oh, the king? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and and Kristoff. Which king is that? Uh, King George. George, okay. I wanted to say that confidently that it was King George, but I was like, "Mm, I don't want to not, I don't want to butcher American history. Uh, Well, I just did by guessing it was the third. He could have been the second. Jamie, watch Hamilton. That's a side story anyway. (laughs) Um, The fun part, people are going to think you have an unhealthy relationship with Jamie, by the way. (laughs) Well, you know, we're supportive of him. He supports us. It's all, it's all good fun. Yes. So the fun part of TB is that many strands of it are resistant to the medication that have been used to treat it. Fun, huh? It can take a cocktail of drugs consisting of two to several combinations of medications to treat TB, and it can take up to six months to fully kill the bacteria and prevent any germies left over from mutating into another form of antibiotic resistance, TB. Oh, laughing at germies. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm a mom. It's because I've had friends named Jeremy my entire life, and they hate being called Jeremy. <laughs> I have Jeremy, and my phone is Jeremy. Do you? <laughs> yes. I'm going to tell him that. He's going to be so mad. He, I mean, he works at a lab, too, so he, we can call him Jeremy. Yeah, well, I've literally only messaged him one time to send him a picture of those little maggots that were on my <laughs> Something that looked like a germ. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so there are two forms of TB, latent and active. And active In a latent state of TB, you have the infection coursing through your body or it's managed to wall itself off. So the bacteria are in an inactive state. You are not infectious to other people or you are presenting no symptoms and it's just along for the ride. And you don't even know you have it. Um, it's the worst kind of hitchhiker. At this point, you are just a walking time bomb. In fact, it's estimated that there are two billion people walking around this planet with latent TB, just waiting for it to become active. And this can be brewing inside of you for anywhere between a few weeks or after the initial infection or to multiple years later. That's fun. I mean, it's not completely like a rare bacteria in that regard no there's a reason why a lot of hospital grade disinfectants well every hospital grade disinfectant has to be tuberculosis. oh my gosh a tuberculosidal disinfectant <laughs> i was gonna let you muscle through that. <laughs> yep i've been drinking so um in the active state of tb things get a little bit worse this form of tb you present symptoms in an active infection and you are now contagious congratulations you've graduated to the next level i don't think that's how I don't think it's a congratulatory thing. But. No, just wait. Um, so let's talk about the symptoms and complications that can ha- that can happen in an active TB infection. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Pins and needles. Yep. So the symptoms. Uh, coughing that lasts for more than three weeks. Straight. You never stop. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> coughing up blood because the blood vessels in your lungs are starting to weaken and bleed. Chest pains while breathing or coughing, unintentional weight loss, fatigue, fever, night sweats, chills, and loss of appetite. Not so bad, right? Sounds like the keto diet. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) Calling some people out. So um, TB can also infect other parts of the body. So here are the complications that can be involved with an active TB infection. 
So apart from being fatal, if left untreated, it can also spread uh, throughout the body, causing spinal pain, joint pain, and damage in the form of, I'm going to slaughter this, tuberculosis, arthritis, um, meningitis, which can lead to lasting or intermittent headaches or mental changes, liver or kidney problems, which can cause sepsis and can potentially kill you, and a heart disorder, which is rare, called cardiac tamponade. Fancy sounding. Tamponade. Huh? tamponade. A nice tamponade. It sounds like a Mexican dish. <laughs> yes. Um, which is when the tissues around your heart become infected with the TB, which in turn causes inflammation and fluid to be collected around the heart, interfering with its ability to pump blood. Oh, so it's a nice slow killer. Kind of slowly breaks down the body piece by piece. Yes. And it can take years to even like activate inside of your body. Fun. Yeah. Um, Definitely fits the bill of terrible. So you can Yes. So this is where you're going to have lots of fun. Uh, TB testing consists firstly of a skin test, which you've had done, Mm -hmm. um, where a small amount of PPD tuberculin is injected under the skin. And if a hard red bump shows up, then you have TB. So be glad yours was just a bubble that went away. Yeah. So next they confirm it with a blood test. Then imaging tests, such as a chest X-ray, where it determines if you are in a latent or an active stage. And lastly, your favorite kind of test, a sputum test. Ugh, sputum's gross. <laughs> and that's to, to, to determine what type of TB you have and if it's drug resistant. Sputum, for the record, is just like the worst kind of snot you've ever seen. It's not cool. All those COVID tests, right? I can set up stool cultures all day, every day. But a sticky sputum just triggers a gag reflex that i don't didn't know i had okay it's disgusting (laughs) you laugh because you know i'm just also trying not to make a gag reflex joke oh good job oh thank you self-control so tb finally started to really throw its weight around and get labeled as a pandemic by the 17th century by then according to london's bill of mortality one out of five yeah (laughs) One out of five people died of consumption, leading to the heroin chic fashion trend. TB made you weak, emaciated, and pale, which became all the rage amongst the ladies of the Victorian er- um, era. Like, I'm not joking. It became something people strove for. Um, so much so that some people... That Gwen Stefani look? Yeah. No. Like, thinner. Gwen Stefani in the 90s. Um, well, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So people actually, mostly women, went out to become purposely infected so they could really just delve into to that lifestyle Mm -hmm. um eventually it earned the name um the white plague of europe nice yeah instead of the black plague yeah 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 just trying to hit every color we Mm -hmm. need a color for covid i mean i don't know if it has a color i was just assuming there's probably a gray plague in between the white and the black plague but there wasn't no I no. know there wasn't. No. <laughs> you were you were waiting for me to tell you about it? There's not one. No. The only other one that I can think of is like the Justinian's Plague, but that happened like way before the mm-hmm. Black Plague. Um, so to gather more information on the disease, autopsies were uh, starting to be performed, and one doctor named John Mange, Manget, I don't know. It's, M-A- probably, it's probably Magnet. You just typoed it. No. No. I made sure it wasn't a typo. <laughs> Um, performed an autopsy on a patient and found tubercles so small as to resemble millet seed present in all parts of the body. All parts. All parts. Nice. Yes. Get, nice visual for you. Get, getting after those little, whatever you call them, tubercules. Yep. Tubercules. <laughs> At the turn of the 19th century, the worldwide death toll reached an estimated 7 million people a year with 50 million people um, with active infections. 25% of all deaths in New York City between 1810 and 1815 were attributed to tuberculosis. By the 1850s, doctors realized the importance of good nutrition, fresh air, and isolation from the general public. Isolation from the general... Oh, for the tuberc... I thought you meant just for people in general. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be like, we need good diets, we need fresh air, we need to stay away from people. Perfect. Uh, ideal. And then you're like, that's just for the... Oh, that's just for the patients. Yes. Gotcha, okay. Yep. So the first sanatoriums were opened in 1854 by Dr. Hermann Bremer of Germany. It provided a place for people to remain outdoors in all weather conditions and a rich diet. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet inside a greenhouse. It's perfect. Everything's there. Except it's like Germany. So even if it's snowing, they're like, too bad, suffer in the snow. (laughs) Okay. Fresh air. Totally. 
frostbite, so, fresh air. It's all good for you. I mean, we've got the apps going. It's great. The first open air sanatorium in the United States was opened a year later in 1855. So those are the ones that are always haunted. Okay, gotcha. Yes. And they're always in like the tucked in the mountains somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So first, before the open air sanitarium with the nice fresh air and the bright sunlight, um, there was another hospital. You know it. We've seen it. Um, it's the first TB hospital ever, and it was built in 1842 underground about a half hour walk into a massive cave system known as the mammoth caves oh okay we went there a couple years ago yes and it was lots of fun right yeah dark damp cold no fresh air well i mean the air felt fresh i guess because the cooler temperature maybe right but yeah no it's it's a giant ominous place yeah yeah So the Mammoth Caves are located just outside of Bowling Green, Kentucky, spanning over 5,000 acres with over 412 tunnels of discovered tunnels um, when there's more being found and still being carved out by the River Styx, which is the only bit of the caves we didn't get to see, apart from the literal spelunking expedition you can go on. And it's spelled Styx like the band. Yes. I should find out why. Maybe. Maybe. Someone really loves sticks in the 1850s. No, it's right. I don't know when it was named, but one of them was probably named after the other one. I'm assuming the river was probably named after the band. Really? 412 miles in is the last bit of active cave being dug out. I bet you that was recently found. Maybe. So the cave. It's probably um, just a guy's name, let's be honest. There, yeah. It's always a, a, a dude's a ma- name. A white male. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> So the cave maintains a steady 60 degrees temperature and, according to Atlas Obscura, was described as, although a bit damp, proved to be fine for the lungs, manifestly imparting strength. That's a quote. You seem disappointed with that quote. Uh Uh-huh. So evidence to support this statement was provided by the cave's promoters that none of the workers employed to work in the cave's saltpeter mine became ill, so it must be health-promoting air, right? Or it's because they're all isolated and they're in a cave mining salt yeah. and not coming in contact with anybody but each other. Right. Nope, not that. So according to an 1845 book, it was quoted that it was a common, and uh, I quote, a common and humane practice to employ laborers of enfeebled constitutions who soon restored to health and strength, end quote. Allegedly all thanks to their time spent working in the mines and breathing in the cave's atmosphere. It could be that they were employed and making money and probably eating food and, you know, just getting back on their feet and they're isolated from the general public. But yeah. So now let's discuss the doctor's terrible idea. In 1839, Dr. John Krogan, I think, bought 2,000 <laughs> acres. I never, I didn't look up the pronunciation. That's fine. Next time I'll do better. Nope. That's not, our, that's not what we do here. <laughs> no. Um, so he bought 2,000 acres of the land. The if we was, if we ever get Patreon supporters, I'm going to intentionally butcher their names. Even if it's people we know, I'm just going to intentionally butcher names. That sounds like fun. Right? Yes. Just, just no phonetics. I'm just going to, I'm going to, yeah. Just slaughter them all. Yep. Okay. So Dr. John Croghan bought 2,000 acres of the land the cave was sitting under and convinced the atmosphere of the cave had curative properties. He came to the natural conclusion that it should be turned into a health resort. So in the fall of 1842, Dr. Krogan officially opened the first TB hospital underground in a cave, because who needs sunlight? Comprised of 10 wooden cottages for patients living and two stone buildings that acted as a community dining room and a residence. Each wooden cottage came equipped with a stove and a thermometer so the patients could control the temperature of their building with the specific instructions of keeping the temperature as low as they could stand it. So according to Atlas Obscura... We've seen these buildings. They're like, by buildings, they mean they're like four by eight foot, maybe. They were eight by... There was I like, think they were eight by 12. The cottages were the wooden ones that they oh, took out. Because we, they were still there. The stone A ones couple were. Of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, those are the stone ones. Yes. Gotcha. Yep. The wood ones are probably gone now. They are. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so according to Atlas Obscura, Dr. Krogan described this little community he planned as picturesque, yet at the same time, a gloomy and mournful appearance. Yeah, say, as long as you don't like plants or sunshine or animals. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> just solid darkness, too. And we know how dark that is with just the sad little lanterns that they have yeah. to carry around. Um, 
So 11 consumptives, which are the TB infected yep. in patients, mm-hmm. four companions, and one, quote, child of an invalid went into the cave. <laughs> yes. Went into the cave in the fall of 1842. You so put, that's what you put on your like LinkedIn profile. I'm a child of an invalid. <laughs> that or Tinder just to see who swipes. Whoa, that's some weird kink someone's got so <laughs> Hey, hey, we don't yuck somebody's yum. I mean maybe if it involves children we should <laughs> Wait, yuck it. You're what? right. This <laughs> is getting out of control. <laughs> what? I've never heard that expression and I don't ever want to again. Oh, like, if that's okay. That's fine. I'll yeah. try not to say it again. So the life down in the cave was an uneventful one. They synced their time with Well, this no shit. Have you seen the crudes? <laughs> <laughs> they synced their time with the surface above. Light lamps. Um, they lit lamps made of fat, cooked dinners, explored the cave. Can you imagine how good that smelled, though? Horrible. Fat. It, okay. I guess I just assume it smells like bacon being cooked. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but pro- I don't It probably think, doesn't. Yeah, no, I don't <laughs> think every source of fat smells like no, bacon. No, it probably smells like burnt skin more than it does anything mm. else. Um, so they explored the cave, talked with each other, ex- and attended Episcopal church services, and had meals um, brought to them down um, by slaves. Because, you know, it's Kentucky in the mid-1800s. Yeah. So, yeah. Eventually, most patients got used to the darkness of the caves for a little bit. One mentioned that he, quote, seldom hears daylight mentioned, and for myself, seldom think of it, end quote. Later, though, another patient is quoted saying, Sometimes, despite all my exertions to preserve cheerful feelings, I feel sad and desire above all things to return home again. It's just permanent seasonal depression, and they just call that depression. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like we need sunlight. Is there a tanning bed down there? You're fine. Oh, yeah, in the 1800s? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just hold that fat lamp real close to your face. You'll be okay. Yeah. So um, soon, uh, they all started dying. And quickly, when uh, so what started out as an optimistic experiment soon turned terrible. The cold, damp air of the cave turns out is not a good uh, spot thing for lungs that are slowly being filled with uh, TB bacteria and blood. And neither was all the smoke from their cooking fires. So one patient did get wise and ducked out before the experiment ended. So five patients died inside of Mammoth Cave. Their bodies were laid out on this flat, giant plinth of stone that was dubbed Corpse Rock before Dr. Krogan decided to end the experiment and head back up to the surface. The remaining patients, upon their arrival back to the surface, were described once they were there. Um, They reached the light again, and it was discovered that all their eyes were perfectly black, no matter their original color had been. Oh, that's terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. It's also the 1800s, so it could have been exaggerated, but... They're just so dilated that, yeah, they probably looked black. And they might have gone back to some color at some point. Eventually, yeah. Didn't, like, the temperature and the conditions, like, preserve the bodies, too? Yeah, so they found that was one of the reasons why um, they thought the air was so potent and good for you is because it did, it preserved bones because there wasn't a lot of bacteria growing because there was no sunlight. Like that one body that that one explorer found. Do you remember them telling that story? Yeah, like up on a, cl- mm-hmm. like a ledge somewhere. Yeah, yeah, he just reached and felt hair. Yeah, that's normal. Yeah. Happens every day. Mm Mm-hmm. In a cave, I'm sure it does. So it was too late for the remaining consumptives. All died not long after leaving the cave, and there's no record of their companions or the child that went with them. The deadly experiment only lasted a few months, from the fall of 1845 through early 1843. Wow. That doesn't seem like good math at all, doesn't it? Not unless you're still in that um, A.D. Or B.C. Yeah, time no, frame. Um, 1842 mm-hmm. um, to, through early 1843. Gotcha. I've read through this twice. Missed it both times. You just skimmed the numbers. Clearly. Well, those are right. <laughs> and it proved that cold, damp air and lack of sunlight is actually detrimental for human health. Even at the time, with as little known about the disease as the, prevail- um, as the prevailing theory of infection still centered around miasma and germ theory was um, coming to the forefront, Dr. Krogan's peers were shocked that he even tried the experiment in the first place. The prevailing theory to help cure TB at the time involved fresh air and sunlight. A cave offers neither of those things. He never published anything about the experiment's findings or its deadly outcomes, nor did he mention how he felt about it or the lives of the people that died in the mammoth caves. He just wrote it off as a whoops. He really did. 
Um, he even refused to admit failure, later writing in a letter that he acknowledged that smoke collection in the cave irritated his patient's lungs, but believed this could be fixed by drilling a shaft from the surface down to the invalid's village. That's a n- nice little term he's got. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. He could have just called it invalid. That's bad. <laughs> I'm just saying, he missed an opportunity. <laughs> Dr. Kogan did eventually give up on the idea um, to turn the Mammoth Caves into a health resort and instead focused on turning them into a tourist destination. And he later died in 1849. Can you guess of what? Uh, I'm going to say tuberculosis. Yes. How did nice. you know? Did they put him on corpse rock? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You know, we should look into where he was buried. I didn't. I didn't look that up. So the wooden cabins were eventually dismantled and brought up to the surface in pieces, but the two stone cottages remain in the tunnels. Mm-hmm. They, um, so now you can go on tours of the cave if you want to see the old tuberculosis hospital. Right now they have self-guided historical tours that you can do by yourself that's less than two hours because of the Rona. Um, I would suggest waiting until everything's over if you're really curious. It's a national park too, right? It's not a state park. I think it's national. It is that? a national yeah. park. Yep. Um, so I definitely waiting. Uh, I would definitely recommend waiting until the pandemic's over um, because they have an extended historical tour that's guided, and there's over two hours long. But you get to hear all the fun facts about the history of the cave, um, and pick your tour your tour guide's brain if you really wanted to. Uh, and if you're listening to this, we assume you're into that kind of stuff. Yeah, just total nerds and losers like us. Um, all centered around dead bodies. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. great. It's great. Uh, that's how we learned about the. You're guys. amongst friends. It's fine. <laughs> yes. That's how we learned about the guy that stuck his hand up over a cliff and found um, hair. Yeah. Well, no, they have like a little sign to like with like a. Yeah, they did memorialize. And I think they left his remains there, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's still a skeleton there. Yeah. Um, it's we... just a catacomb now. There's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we um, also did the Violet City Cave Tour, which is where um, that's the one where you get to walk like you, the mile into the cave to the TB. And then you walk like another half mile down and there are no more lights. You just get to spend the next two and a half hours in complete darkness. No, you have like a lantern. Yeah, the lantern. Yeah, it's, but it's yeah, definitely limited visibility. Very limited, but it was super cool. So I highly, I highly recommend that one. Um, so yeah. And if you're really into caves, you can do the six hour tour where they give you coveralls and a headlamp and you get to crawl your way through the tunnels. Um, and according to Mammoth's Caves National Park website, um, your chest and waist can't be bigger than 42 inches or you're not going to fit through the holes that they have you shimmying through. Which is why we didn't do it. No. Because <laughs> I have shoulders because I'm a human. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also like claustrophobia and fear well, of like, Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, besides like, actually... the obvious <laughs> fact of, yeah, like, yeah, I don't even want to no. know. You don't like going in our basement, let alone <laughs> <laughs> no. in a cave where you can't get out quickly. Which... In hindsight, there is no way to get out of the cave anywhere quickly. Well, not quickly, but like there's clear and direct routes. Yeah, that is true. Um, So eventually another doctor came along over a century later and discovered the cure for TB in the form of streptomycin in 1943. And we've been fighting the good fight ever since. Now TB is a relatively rare disease and there's a small chance you will catch it unless you live with someone who has it or are immunocompromised, work in a medical setting such as a hospital or a nursing home, or a lab. It's mainly they tested us for our flebs because they do go to nursing homes. Oh, okay. So they just tested everybody because, I mean, why not? Yeah, but it was mainly for the way. phlebotomist. Yeah. yeah. Um, or living or visiting a country where it is endemic, such as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Other than that, you probably are pretty <laughs> Only safe. Only like half the world. Yes. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, just don't go anywhere. I was anywhere. expecting you to say like a very like small area. You're like, no. all of Latin America, all of Africa, all of Asia. Oh, uh, okay. That's yeah. that's quite a bit. Yeah, there's a reason why a lot of hospital grade disinfectants ha- are like they fight against TB because it yeah. really is a, a problem. We've just managed to contain it here. Yeah. Um. So as long as you don't go to others, all those places, you're probably pretty safe. Because <laughs> it would be as long as you just stay here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. forever. Yep. And don't ever get old. You're fine. Yeah. Because uh, it'd be quite a bummer to get it, right? Well, yeah. Okay, so... See minute four of this podcast, <laughs> yes. So I mean, you, I would love to be thin for, like, a couple days, but I don't want to have to, like, cough up blood for it. Yeah, or get, like, meningitis or 
have a drug resisted like strain where you wind up on antibiotics you're, for six months. You're the one who's allergic to every antibiotic there is. So I'm you'd, allergic you'd, to you'd amoxicillin. Be... <laughs> they don't use that drug for this. There's a whole list of them and they're words I can't pronounce. So. Oh well, yeah, that's how drugs work. That is true. Yeah. So how do you feel after that? Um, I feel pretty good. Okay. That one's not like that one is more like that was super informative. Very. But without like victim names or like bullets going through people's bodies it doesn't hurt as bad for Mm -hmm. me to listen to um and science in the 18 anything is going to be pretty sketchy so like i don't even blame the doctor for but like after the first oh no his peers knew it was going to be a problem and they all told him so well okay but let's say like the first part one person dies maybe get everyone else out of the cave yeah like why does it take 11 people dying in a cave for you to be like you know what we should probably call this quits well five people died and then Everybody went up, and within a few months, the rest of them yeah, died because but it, it should have taken like damage. the first one. You're like, oh, oh, this is not good. But everybody well. died. Every any person that got it wound up well, that's, dead. Yeah, true. I guess he was just seeing it out, but yeah. still, like, so that's why I said I don't really blame the doctor. Like, if it's that bad and it's killing like five million people a year, seven. Okay, seven million people a year. That's a big difference. That was like a half hour ago. What do you want from me? <laughs> um. I get like trying to push the envelope a little bit and like yeah. trying different things and like caves are, I mean, it's a fun place. I don't yeah, know if they I got wanna... to explore it in the dark. <laughs> the patients. You're just hacking have, like, up blood fun... and you're like, oh, go take a walk in the dark. Maybe you'll never come back because you'll die somewhere. But that's fine. We'll put you on Corpse Rock, uh, which is like the Fraggle Rock, like the dark website of we Fraggle We saw rock. it. It was, remember when we were walking yeah, down, no. it was that big rock yeah. off to the off to the right? But still, like it's, I don't. Blame that, but you gotta like know when to, for lack of a better term, pull the plug <laughs> on an experiment. <laughs> Sorry, that there was. Don't worry, they weren't on ventilators or anything. Um, <laughs> not that we know. Well, yeah, it's eighteen hundreds. They yeah, definitely were not on ventilators. No. They just took those little like um those little um pi- those big fans. That the they flumes bo- or whatever yes, for the, the that they for fireplace. With. Yeah, just stick it in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, and really pump it. Yeah, just the you're just your air in and out over and over again. Yeah, yeah you're gonna be so healthy by the end of this. <laughs> no, I feel fine. And if you made it this far, congratulations. That's that's quite the achievement. Um, but yeah, that's the, you're done. Paper, yeah, that paper. one was. That was your last bad. page. Yep. Okay. Oh, I have sources to go over, but we can do that in a minute. You can go ahead and save now. Okay. All right. Source me. Sources. So I used the Atlas, the Atlas Obscura articles about the TB hospital, Mayo Clinic, the WHO, CDC, National Park Service um, for Mammoth Caves, TB. The oh, who? Like H O. World Health. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> Not the band. No. <laughs> We've had a Who reference and a Sticks reference, though. So I mean, we're about to put some records on. Just yeah. Okay. Um, and then I use tvfacts.org and the good old Wikipedia. Oh, trusty. Nice. Trust. Hey, you know, we are not. A, I mean, we're not doctors here, nor do we claim to be. Um, but yeah. No, if you think you have TB, go see your doctor. Yeah, get tested. It's just a little bubble under your skin; it goes away. Yep. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening. That was episode, what, three? Three. Nice. Okay, bye. (laughs) I'm going to cut that giant pause out of you looking panicked. All right. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for listening to our terrible podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at TMSTPod. And if you'd like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon. At Tell Me Something Terrible. Oof, that was terrible.